Part four of the Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, seventeen fifty eight to seventeen seventy five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. The Military Journals of Two Private Soldiers, seventeen fifty eight to seventeen seventy five, by Abraham Tomlinson. Part four. Sunday, twenty fifth. We got two bateaux. A bateau is a kind of scow or flat boat used on shallow streams like the Hudson above Waterford to carry our packs up to Saratoga. Saratoga. This settlement was near the mouth of the Fish Creek on the south side. The village of Shulaville is just across the stream on the north side. On the plain in front of the village of Shulaville was a regular quadrangular fortification with bastions called Fort Hardy. It was erected in seventeen fifty six and named in honour of the governor of new york at that time and we went afoot and eight of our men were drawn out to stay at satellogue captain lewis shot at an indian and killed him and sot in bateau from salatogue we marched on to fort miller on the west side of the hudson six or eight miles below fort edward the river is there broken by swift rapids during this campaign major afterwards general putnam was here surprised by a party of indians and boldly descended the rapids in a canoe and escaped it was a feat they never dared to attempt and they felt certain that he was under the protection of the great spirit here a stream called bloody run enters the hudson it is so named because a party of soldiers from the garrison in seventeen fifty nine went there to fish were surprised by the indians and nine were killed and scalped and lodged there monday twenty sixth rainy and wet I came up the river in a bateau to Fort Edward, to the encampment. There we drad half a pound of powder, and ten bullets apiece, and eight days' provision, in order to march to the lake, Lake George. Barnabas Evings was very poor with fever nago, fever and arg, and was forced to stay behind, and David Bishop with him. We lodged in bush tents, and very wet it was. Tuesday the 27th. Marched all of Colonel Fitch's Fitch's regiment that were here with three teams to carry the officers we arrived at the halfway brook afterward called snooks creek it enters the hudson three miles below fort edward and there a great parcel stationed for a while and thence we marched to lake george and went over upon the hill east and there encamped one with myself went upon guard this night wednesday the twenty eighth we cleared our ground and pitched our tents I sent two letters home. Thursday the 29th. Still here. General Lyman. General Phineas Lyman, who built Fort Edward. He was a native of Durham, Connecticut, where he was born in 1716. He completed his education at Yale College, and afterwards became an eminent lawyer. He was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Connecticut Forces in 1755, and in the expedition to Lake George deserved all the honour awarded to General Johnson, who was jealous of Lyman's ability as a soldier. Lyman did his duty nobly, and was but little noticed. Johnson was unfit for his station, but being a nephew of Sir Peter Warren, then a popular English admiral, he received the honour of knighthood, and the sum of twenty thousand dollars for his services in that campaign. General Lyman served with distinction until the close of the campaign in 1760, and in 1762 commanded the American forces sent against Havana. He was in England about eleven years, and after his return went with his family to the Mississippi, where he died in 1788. And Colonel Fitch's regiment come up to the lake this day. I wash my clothes. One more regiment come up. Friday 30th. This day there was a very unhappy mishap, fell out in province forces, and that was one shot one partly through the body, but did not kill him. The man which was shot lived at Bridgewater. Today they drawed out nine men to go in bateaux up the lake. Saturday, July 1st. Colonel Worcester. Colonel David Worcester of Connecticut, the eminent general of the Revolution, who was killed at Ridgefield while engaged in the pursuit of Tyron after the burning of Danbury in the spring of 1777. He was born in Stratford, Connecticut, in March 1710, graduated at Yale College in 1738, and soon afterwards received the appointment of captain of a vessel in the Coast Guard. He was in the expedition against Louisburg in 1745, 
he afterward went to england where he was a favorite at the court of king george the second and received the appointment of captain in the regular service under sir william pepperell he was promoted to a colonelcy in seventeen fifty five and rose to the rank of brigadier before the close of the french and indian war he was one of the most active men in getting up the expedition against the ticonderoga in seventeen seventy five which resulted in the capture of that fortress and also crown point by colonel ethan allen and benedict arnold worcester was appointed one of the first brigadiers of the continental army in seventeen seventy five and third in rank he was also appointed the first major general of the militia of his state when organized for the war for independence and in that capacity he was employed with arnold silliman and others in repelling british invasion in seventeen seventy seven he lost his life in that service his remains were buried at danbury and in eighteen fifty four a monument was erected over his grave by his grateful countrymen at the expense of his native state and his regiment came up to-day and three of our sick men one of them brought nurse that one man shot another by accident at shanakata and an hour after he died to-day our chaplain chaplain came up one of major rogers commander of a corps of rangers who performed signal services during the greater part of the french and indian war he was the son of an irishman an early settler of dunbarton in new hampshire he was appointed to his command in seventeen fifty five and was a thorough scout in seventeen fifty nine he was sent by general amherst to destroy the indian village of st francis in that expedition he suffered great hardships but was successful he served in the cherokee war in seventeen sixty one and in seventeen sixty six was appointed governor of michilly mackinac where he was accused of treason and sent to montreal in irons he was acquitted went to england and after suffering imprisonment for debt returned to america where he remained until the revolution broke out he took up arms for the king and in seventeen seventy seven went to england where he died his journal of the french and indian war is a valuable work men came in that had been gone seven days and expected to be gone but two he was so beat out that he could not tell what had become of t'other this night i went upon a bateau and guarded colonel fitch's tub of butter sunday second in the forenoon i went to meeting and heard mr eels his text was in the fifth chapter of james sixteenth verse a good sermon i wrote a letter and sent home and in the afternoon to meeting again monday third yesterday major putnam's s company came up and this morning major putnam israel putnam afterward the revolutionary general he was born in salem massachusetts in january seventeen eighteen he was a vigorous lad and in seventeen thirty nine we find him cultivating land in pomfret connecticut the scene of his remarkable adventure in a wolf's den so familiar to every reader he was appointed to the command of some of the first troops raised in connecticut for the french and indian war in seventeen fifty five and was an active officer during the entire period of that conflict especially while in command of a corps of rangers he was ploughing in his field when the news of the skirmishes at lexington and concord reached him he immediately started for boston and at the head of the connecticut troops was active in the battle of bunker hill he was one of the first four major generals of the continental army appointed by congress in june 1775 and he was constantly on duty in important movements until 1779 when a partial paralysis of one side of his body disabled him for military service he lived in retirement after the war and died at brooklyn windham county connecticut on the twenty ninth of may seventeen ninety at the age of seventy two years came up and the connecticut's regiment were embodied for to learn how to form your front to the right and to the left for general abercromber general james abercromby the commander-in-chief of the campaign he was descended from an ancient scotch family and because of signal services on the continent was promoted to the rank of major general the military art having been his profession since boyhood he was superseded by lord amherst after his defeat at ticonderoga and returned to england in the spring of seventeen fifty nine and his aide-de-camp to view tuesday fourth this day i cut my hat and received my ammunition and provision for four days and made ready for to go on wednesday fifth this day the army by sunrise got ready for to march and marched off by water and arrived at the sabbath day point sabbath day point 
this is a fertile little promontory jutting out into lake george from the western shore a few miles from the little village of hague and surrounded by the most picturesque scenery imaginable it was so named at this time because it was early on sunday morning that abercrombie and his army left this place and proceeded down the lake there a small provincial force had a desperate fight with the party of french and indians in seventeen fifty six and defeated them abercrombie's army went down the lake in bateau and whale boats and reached the point just at dark captain afterward general stark relates that he supped with the young lord howe that evening at the point and that the nobleman made many anxious inquiries about the strength of ticonderoga the country to be traversed etc and by his serious demeanour evinced a presentiment of his sad fate he was killed in a skirmish with a french scout two days afterward his body was conveyed to albany in charge of captain afterward general philip schuyler and buried there he was a brother of the admiral and general of that name who commanded the british naval and land forces in america in seventeen seventy six and stayed there till midnight then marched again to the first narrows and landed there and went down thursday sixth twelve o'clock at night we marched off again the order of march says major rogers exhibited a splendid military show there were sixteen thousand well-armed troops lord howe in a large boat led the van of the flotilla accompanied by a guard of rangers and expert boatmen the regular troops occupied the centre and the provincials the wings the sky was clear and starry and not a breeze ruffled the dark waters as they slept quietly in the shadows of the mountains their oars were muffled and so silently did they move on that not a scout upon the hills observed them and the first intimation that the outposts of the enemy received of their approach was the full blaze of their scarlet uniforms when soon after sunrise they landed and pushed on to award ticonderoga and landed at the first narrows and then we marched on to the falls rapids in the stream which forms the outlet of lake george into lake champlain here are now extensive saw and grist mills the distance from the foot of lake george to fort ticonderoga is about four miles within two miles of the fort and there we was attacked by the enemy the english lacked suitable guides and became bewildered in the dense forest that covered the land lord howe was second in command and led the van preceded by major putnam and a scout of one hundred men to reconnoitre the french set fire to their own outpost and retreated howe and putnam dashed on through the woods and in a few minutes fell in with the french advanced guard who were also bewildered and were trying to find their way to the fort a smart skirmish ensued and at the first fire lord howe another officer and several privates were killed the french were repulsed with the loss of about three hundred killed and about one hundred and forty made prisoners the english battalions were so much broken confused and fatigued that abercrombie ordered them back to the landing-place where they bivouacked for the night and the engagement held one hour and we killed and took upwards of two and fifty and of captain holmes company we had three men wounded sergeant cader sergeant armsper and ensign robbins and at sundown the french came out again five thousand strong and our men came back again to the landing place and lodged there friday seventh major rogers went down to the mills and drove them off therefrom and killed and took upwards of a hundred and fifty and at sundown the last of the army marched down to the mills and major putnam made a bridge over by the landing place this night we lodged by the mills saturday eighth then march back two or three regiments to the landing-place to guard and help get up the artillery and we worked all the forenoon on loading the bateaus and at noon we set out down to the mills with the artillery and we got near the mills and we had orders to leave the artillery there this was abercrombie's fatal mistake he sent an engineer to reconnoitre the fort and outworks the engineer reported the latter to be so weak in an unfinished state as to be easily carried without artillery by the forces of english bayonets the difficulties in the way of heavy cannons in that dense forest were very formidable and abercrombie was willing to rely upon sword and bayonet on the strength of his engineer's report that functionary was mistaken and when the english approached the french lines they found an embankment of earth and stones eight feet in height strongly guarded by abatis or felled trees with their tops outward the english made a furious attack cut pathways through these prostrate trees and mounted the parapet they were instantly slain 
and thus scores of Britons were sacrificed by discharges of heavy cannons. When two thousand men had fallen, Abercrombie sounded a retreat, and the whole British army made its way to the landing place at the foot of Lake George, with a loss of twenty-five hundred muskets. They went up the lake to Fort William Henry, and the wounded were sent to Fort Edward and to Albany. At his own solicitation, Colonel Bradstreet was sent to attack the French fort Frontenac, where Kingston now stands at the foot of Lake Ontario, and General Stanwix proceeded to erect a fort towards the headwaters of the Mohawk, where the village of Rome now flourishes, and go back and get our arms, and we went down to the mills of our regiment. Two hundred were ordered to go over onto the point to keep the French from landing there, and we stayed, while next morning sun two hours high, and when we came in, all our army and artillery was gone back, and the mills fired, and we marched back to the landing place, and had to secure the matter of two hundred barrels of flour, and we heard the French were a coming upon us, and we strove them all, and come of us as soon as we could, and about ten o'clock we got sail, and by sundown we arrived at Lake George. The head of the lake was especially designated as Lake George. There was the dilapidated Fort William Henry built by Sir William Johnson in the autumn of 1755, and about half a mile southeast from it Fort George was afterward erected. The ruins of its citadel may yet, 1854, be seen. According to all accounts, the engagement began about ten o'clock, and held ten hours steady, and we lost three thousand regulars. End of Part 4 Recording by FNH Please visit www.bookranger.co.uk